Hey everybody, it's Carter and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series where I get to sit and chat with other authors and just kind of shoot the shit and figure them out. And uh, it's fun. I've met some really interesting people on this show and it's been fantastic. And I've learned, I've learned lots of things. Um, so I just had my, I just had my birthday. Uh, I just turned 52, which sounds, it's, it, it, it sounds like a boring year. And I, and I guess maybe it is, you know, 50 was a big year. Um, I was going to have a big party, but then there was COVID. So we ended up, it was actually the first time we had, uh, people over, uh, we had about, uh, 10 people over and we all sat in my backyard in a circle <laughs> and, and stared at each other and drank for hours. Um, and it was amazing. Um, 52. No real party, no real party at 52. Um, but it was fun. I, 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 I had a good birthday and, and I actually read my horoscope for the upcoming year, which I never do. Um, cause I just, <laughs> I just don't believe in any of that stuff, but I did read it and it said 52 was going to be a pivotal, pivotal year in my life that I would be extremely busy. Things would be volatile. Um, but, uh, things would bear fruit. So it kind of sounds like that's probably every horoscope ever written, but anyway, it sounded kind of cool to me. So I'm excited. So I'm 52. Um, what else is going on? Not too much is going on. Let me tell you who I talked to today. Um, I talked to Ashley Winstead. So Ashley, Ashley is lovely and she, she's with my same publisher source books. Um, and I got a chance to actually meet her when I was in thriller fest, but, uh, I had, you know, I'd interviewed her first. And, um, so Ashley holds a PhD in contemporary American literature from Southern Methodist university and a BA in English and art history from Vanderbilt. So she is what we would call very learned, uh, uh, and she put all of that education to use and she started writing novels. Uh, so her, she had a huge breakout hit in 2021 with her thriller in my dreams. I hold a knife, uh, which is a fantastic title for a book. I'm kind of jealous. Uh, I wish I had a book title quite like that. Um, and then this August, she's coming out with, um, a follow-up novel, the last housewife. Uh, so it was great. And she has a rom-com book out as well. Uh, she's fantastic to talk to. I really enjoyed my conversation. I hope you will as well. This is me talking to Ashley Winstead. So you're, you're in Texas. I am Houston, Texas. How's that? Hot? Um, yeah, right now, swampy, um, <laughs> on the verge of thunderstorming. So we're the Bayou City. So we got some of that like New Orleans flair, which is actually <laughs> one of my favorite parts. I'm not like from Texas originally, but I've been very pleased to like discover a lot of coolness about Houston. Oh, nice. Where? So yeah. where are you from originally? Oh, uh, military kid. So oh, so uh, everywhere. Yeah, exactly. So I never know how to answer that question. Sometimes <laughs> I like just choose one of the places I lived and I'm like, that's, that's the one. What, where's the place where you have the fondest childhood memories? Probably California, like between San Diego and, uh, Point Magoo. Okay. Yeah. I grew so, up in Ventura County until oh, I, I was 18. So I know that area pretty well. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, I, I have the fondest memories of, of being there. We were only there for two years, um, but I, I usually say like, yeah, I'm from California. So I'm from California. <laughs> it's just easy to say. Yeah. Exactly. I, you know, it's funny. I left when I was 18 and then I've gone back, you know, I lived there actually in San Francisco for a few years uh, after college. But aside from that, I rarely go back. And when I do, it's just kind of overwhelming. It's especially yeah. LA is just, it's, it's fun to see friends and stuff. I'm like, Oh Jesus, I'm glad I don't live here. I tried to live in Los Angeles after college. I lived there for about a year and a half and it was extraordinarily expensive and very mm -hmm. overwhelming. Um, and I decided to go to grad school instead. Yep. <laughs> yep. That was a good call. Six years. Yeah. Just to get out of there. So I, I've definitely talked to some authors who were, um, military brats and you know i'm part of this show is like i just love to hear about people's origin stories within the realms of, of of creativity whatever that creativity is and 
I feel like with the military brats I've spoken to, it was just like that. Yeah, we're constantly moving. Um, and so, you know, books were my friend. Books books were my like kind of stability. I don't know if that was the case for you or not. Oh, 100%. We should like form a support group or something, <laughs> like a common interest group. But yeah, well, it's not like you turned friend. to heroin. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. books are okay. Out of all the paths available to mm-hmm. us, uh, we chose a pretty healthy one. But yeah, books books were my friends. Um, books were like the home you, you take with you. And um, also a thing that was in your control. Like you got to pick mm. up a book and control um, entering that world. In, and when you're a kid, kind of being uprooted every two years, um that feels wildly out of your control yeah that's so hard because you you know i you know i can't quite wrap my head around that because that did, wasn't my experience we've traveled or moved a couple times but just especially depending on your age like if you're 13 and you're moving that's pretty brutal <laughs> yeah um and and for a shy shy folk um which i count myself as like an extreme introvert um oh. there's there's one memory i have actually I think there was like an entire year of school where my I the only memory I have of it an entire grade is the the view of my feet shuffling across the linoleum floor because I just kept my head down (laughs) and didn't talk to anyone and was just terrified so oh wow so you were you were a shy kid you have did you have siblings growing up I'm the oldest of four and so that was that, that was definitely a blessing like we had our we were a unit we had our our pack that was nice. And were, or are both your parents in the military? They were originally actually, yeah. like my parents met in the Navy. And okay. then after my mom had both me and my younger brother, she decided like, this is a little bit too hard to juggle all these things. Um, so she left the Navy and, but my father basically retired recently from it. Oh, okay. So he was a lifer. He was yeah. a lifer. And that just didn't hold any interest for you or or what about your siblings did anyone end up following in their footsteps my brother actually um the younger the one who's uh right after me i have two but um the the older of them went into the army and married um a a woman in the army and he my brother left but the the, his wife my sister-in-law is like a very badass captain in the army and just like was working at the pentagon and is now getting sent somewhere else so i'm yeah, she does. She's super cool. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. But yeah, that wasn't yeah. that wasn't your path. Um, Not mine. No. And so as you're as you're kind of <laughs> changing schools every two years, are you thinking about college at this time? Or are you thinking about what you want to do? Or are you just holding on for dear life? <laughs> yeah, I always so such a bookish person uh-huh. um, growing up. And yeah, college was like in, ingrained in my head. Neither of my parents went to college. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they both really wished that they had, even and though they're the first born. Their... So there's a and lot of pressure. I, yes. Um, I was actually the first person in my college or family on both sides to go to college. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of, there was, I, I will say not so much pressure, um, or there was pressure, but I put it all on myself um, because just wanted to live up to expectations and right. also knew like the life of the mind was what I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, dreaming about college from an early age. And what, and what do you remember, like what you were reading back, you know, when you were kind of all bookish and young? Oh my gosh. So when I was super young, I was just into, give me a series with like a hundred plus books in it. So Sweet Valley oh. High, uh-huh. I did those Babysitter's Club. Those were, um, I would just really um, gobble up anything. There was one, when we lived in Point Magoo, there, we lived on base and there was a library on base actually. And so it was like this private library, it felt like. Um, and I was allowed to walk there by myself at age mm nine or 10. Uh, Um, So of course I was there all the time, have very fond memories of like walking back home with a stack of books so high that I I rested it between my chin and my my hands. Yeah. Um, But I read all of the children's lit in that library and then moved on to the adult books. Yep. <laughs> like read things that I really shouldn't have read at that age and uh, got in trouble <laughs> you, a few times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your story, you're the poster child for a would-be writer. You know, this is like, you're hitting all the, 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 the boxes I, here. I know, I'm just a, yeah. I'm a stereotypical, like check those boxes. This is, 
person's going to grow up cursed to be a writer. So where did you go do your undergraduate and what did you study? I, so I went, um, once again, just sticking with the theme of, of the writer thing, uh, went to Vanderbilt University in Nashville mm, and yep. majored in English and creative Wonderful writing. College, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was very fortunate to, um, study with great writers, great poets, um, great short fiction writers who were on staff there, um, which was wonderful, but it also warped my idea of what the path to being a writer looked mm -hmm. like. Because I looked at all of them, uh, my professors, and I was like, okay, well, clearly what I need to do next is go get my MFA. Um, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, you know, uh, so I applied at 22 to like a dozen MFA programs and got brutally rejected from mm. all of them. That's your first lesson about becoming a writer. <laughs> I mean, there it was right there. And I, um, I did not have the right reaction to it. I, I, I looked at that rejection at one of which was from Vanderbilt's own creative writing program, oh, which, yeah. was, which burned, um, and I thought, okay, well, I've thought for 22 years, this was my path. The world is clearly telling me it's not. So I didn't write again for 10 years after that. Oh, wow. So you did not go and get your MFA. I did not go. Yeah, um, that was, yeah. so yeah, yeah. I, I've interviewed, only, so there's a bunch of different schools of thoughts about it. I mean, I, I, I've never taken a writing course in my life, yeah. um, but you know, I, I hear from the MFA authors that it was a valuable experience but it doesn't prepare them to actually be a writer <laughs> like not yeah. maybe to write but not to exist within the world of publishing um there wasn't a lot of like just you know here's how you find an agent um things like that it was just the this practical kind of, stuff the, the, well and the stuff ultimately as you get older you realize oh this is a shit that's actually <laughs> important and yeah. i need to know this and it's a lot to learn and a lot to navigate um so, but that's, that's really interesting. So, I mean, you know, you were so, sounds like kind of traumatized by, by rejection yeah. um, that, that you went on to do what then for 10 well, years? So I, I did some cool stuff. I stayed in Nashville, worked in the music industry, um, had yeah. some awesome experiences, some very harrowing experiences I'm in the sure. music industry. Um, and then I, I didn't have enough trauma, I guess. So I left Nashville for Los Angeles, which is, you know, wh when I tried to um, live there for about a year and a half and worked in the entertainment industry, working for Warner Brothers, like on the TV and digital side, and then thought, okay, um, entertainment industry isn't for me. Um, when was the last time we were happy? That was in school, you know? And so yeah. I was like, what we're going to do is like go back and get my PhD, because if I can't write books, at least I'm going to study them mm -hmm. and be as close as I, I possibly can. And it's kind of funny because I, I studied um, MFA culture and there's there's a lot of scholarly mm. writing about the impact of the rise of MFA programs, you know, kind of like mid 20th century. This is where I nerd out. So stop me <laughs> when it's when I get to. This is a pretty nerdy but... podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're, okay. you're good. <laughs> No, there, but there's so much fascinating scholarship about the way the rise of the MFA programs, uh, especially in the U.S., changed literature, like changed um, like the actual creative, the shape and the form of, of writing. Um, like in probably, what way? For, yeah. for better, for worse, for just more, well, you know, more, more content? Scholars never tell you their actual opinions, whether they think it's like better or worse. That's an important trick that, that they teach you early on. After you get your PhD, you learn one thing, like you, you, you yeah. don't give an opinion. <laughs> don't, give, don't give them anything. But it's really just like, well, it's a, here's my observations. No, but really thinking about like certain kinds of modes of storytelling, ways of writing that just skyrocketed um, you know, like mid-century in the, in the 20th century and have since uh, been been really like informed literary fiction in particular. So why do we like stories that sound like this? Why do we like you know? Uh, this is you're hearing you're going to hear my opinion filtering here through here, but like very precious ways of writing. You know, spending like three paragraphs to describe a, a you know a, a <laughs> that's the antithesis of, of what I do, do. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> no, same, same. I mean, sometimes I I like 
in, I call, I, I think of it as indulging, but sometimes I indulge in stuff like that. But that is really like the shape. That is a very particular form of writing that is people tie to MFA culture. Yeah. And there's, you know, and it depends on what you're writing for sure, because of course there's, there's an audience in a market for, you know, the literary fiction that you're describing where people have that expectation of a flower being described for three paragraphs and that's what they want. And that's what they're there for. Yeah. Um, you know, thriller writers, you know, I, I actually teach like describe as little as possible because I think it's so important to give your reader, give your reader credit for what they're experiencing and, yeah. and, Honestly, it slows it down if you know, you, and you can use that as a device, but, but I, I think it's great to have the reader kind of form their own opinions about what they're seeing in their head. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, clearly there's a huge market for this style of writing, um, this MFA style of writing. So no shade, but right. I, I think it's funny because I never really think in, in a meta way about what I'm doing, especially the first few drafts of a book. Um, but if I had to analyze myself, I think I do a very little descriptive writing because I'm so keyed in to like the internal landscape of my characters. Mm. That's what I care about. And so that's what right. I, yeah. And it's a balance, right? Because you will get, um, you know, as an author, often you see everything and, yeah. and you're not necessarily aware of how much you're communicating what you're seeing. Uh, and sometimes it can be not enough and people are like, I'm lost. I don't know where they are or what they're doing. You're like, oh, it was totally clear to me when I was ready. <laughs> exactly. They're like, wait, where are we? I, <laughs> I have written entire novels only to realize that I have never once described what my main character looks like or yep. like anything. And that's like okay. That. I think that's yeah. totally okay. And Mr. <laughs> Tinder's girl, you know, it's funny, like I did source books, I'm with source books as well. And, you know, they had a cover that we didn't end up going with, but there was a blonde woman in the cover. I'm like, why is she blonde? They're like, well, that's Alice. That's your protagonist. I'm like, she might be blonde. I'm like, the only thing I described in the entire book was that she had green eyes. That was it. But it was, but that's cool to me that that's how they saw her. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's exciting, but it, but, but so I, I, I'm a big proponent of, of describing very little. So you, you go and you, you get your PhD with the intention yeah. of I'm going to be teaching. Um, and mm -hmm. then what? Um, and then I struggled to get a job on the, on the academic job market. Yeah. Um, so, you know, us millennial folk um, <laughs> always kind of searching and striving for things at the worst <laughs> possible times to be doing it. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I was struggling to figure out what I was going to do with uh, my, my very lengthy degree that I just spent six years on and I lucked out and found an alt act path um, in politics actually huh. in like philanthropy and politics where I used all the skills of my PhD of like analysis and translating really complex ideas into hopefully relatable understandable um, language and I did polit worked in politics for five years um, and you were you did that, uh, where were you living at that time? So that that was why we came here. So I came, moved to Houston actually for two reasons. One, this job that I, um, I actually just left because now I, I get to be a full-time writer, which is exciting. That is exciting. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm like very pleased about that. But um, one one for that job, which was super awesome and had based a, you know here in Houston with offices in DC and New York. And then my husband is a NASA engineer. And mm. so we were, tr we were looking for cities um, that we could both live in. <laughs> like the the NASA engineer in you know, a market is a little bit more limited. <laughs> exactly, because there's like seven centers around the country. Right, you're not going to Jackson, Wyoming to be a NASA engineer. I mean, we would have, yeah, yeah, mm. no, we would have gone like wherever there, it's like Cleveland is one, um, mm, two I think are in California. I mean, Houston's um, the mother load. I would assume, yeah. yeah, command, <laughs> command center, command um, center here. Yeah. So that's he cool. loves it. Yeah. So that's, that's why we ended up here. It's like, it just stars align for both of our jobs. And then at what point are you, you know, overcoming your 10 year old rejection from the MFA program and starting to feel like, yeah, I, I might, I, I might uh, pick up the pen again. Oh man. I had to lie to myself. I had to 
uh, pull the wool over my own eyes to get myself to start writing uh, fiction again. And it was, I had just defended my dissertation. Mm. Uh, you know, it was kind of flying high after that. Like, oh my God, I pulled it off. They convinced them. They're giving <laughs> they me believe me. <laughs> yeah, they believe me. Um, all six years instantly rushed out of my mind. I didn't remember anything. Um, except I, I had taught myself over the course of that, of uh, my getting my PhD, how to like rise and grind. <laughs> I, for lack of a better term, like yeah. how to get up at, you know, early in the morning and do nothing but work until I couldn't keep my eyes open at night. So, um, wow. and that's what I had to do to write my dissertation. Um, and I, I just told myself, okay, you've, you've like built this muscle now um because I was feeling like this itch to keep that routine it's like what if you just turn like did that but but wrote something you actually want to write no offense to my dissertation but you know like something that you're really engaged in and and um and what if you never showed anyone and it wasn't to be published and it wasn't <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. it, yeah, mm -hmm. what if you, it was you are a writer. Holy shit. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every checking every box, basically. The imposter syndrome. <laughs> Deep imposter syndrome. Yeah, like, me too. Uh, yeah. Um, it's, and I love talking about it because I love just, it like, it brings me so much uh, relief to hear from other people that I am not alone. And oh, no. No, thing. you're not. And it's interesting what you say about, you know, building that muscle through dissertation writing and then and then marrying that muscle with a passion because that's what it is. And, and, you know, my observation has been with a lot of aspiring writers, they get in their own way. They, they don't ever finish that draft because it's gotta be perfect or they're waiting for the muse. And it's just like, no, you sit down every day and then maybe you sit down for half an hour, who cares, but do it every day and you build that muscle and then and then don't get in your way and then just get the draft done. And it's going to be a terrible draft. Oh, it's but, going to be you know, so bad. <laughs> but then, but it's, <laughs> it hopefully will come alive in the editing, but you'll never get there if you don't finish it. And finishing is the hardest thing to do. Um, and it all has to do that consistency that you're talking about, getting up early. It doesn't have to be all day, um, but it's got to be something. It's like exercise and you just build exactly. and build and build. And then when you, the days you don't do it, you kind of miss it and you feel gross. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is exactly it. And if I like, whenever I'm asked to give um, writers or like a, advice to as aspiring published authors, that's always it is like build that muscle, build that routine, um, as well as like build a thick skin. <laughs> and on, but on the other side of it, that passion still has to be there because you yeah. can write every day and not enjoy it and it'll never work. I mean, you know, I write at 5 p.m. usually um, for like an hour every day, but that's, I'm so excited at 4.45 because I haven't been thinking about my book at all during the day and I get to go sit there and be like, what's happening? Oh yeah, oh, this is cool. Now what happens? That's an exciting moment for me and something to look forward to every day. And still there are days where it sucks, where you just like, it feels like data entry. This is really sparking, you know, my mind because <laughs> um, like I used to feel that way when I worked full time and then worked and then wrote in, in every hour, I would look forward to it. And I'm having the weirdest experience of now that I'm a full time writer. It is I, I write every single day and I am not having fun. Like I am. It's a struggle. Well, um, it's a different. So I have no idea. So I still have a full time job and I yeah. and that's been through necessity. And, you know, so I've just learned here's how to do it. You write every day and you don't, don't write yeah. that much every day, but you know, that kind of a thing. But I always think about like, you know, and I've taken writing vacations. I'm like, I can't write four hours a day, much less eight hours a day. I don't, that's a muscle I don't have. So I still like to think that I would only still write one to two hours a day, but then there's all the, you know, non-writing related stuff to deal with all the marketing all the pr and yeah. social media you know things like that that i would actually have time to maybe pay a little bit more attention to i did not that was that was the biggest surprise to me about publishing a book was the enormous chunk of time that it was going to take to do everything related to promoting it right um, it's 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 crazy so i'm actually i don't know if you're going to thriller fest this year in new york I am, but, yeah oh you I'm are excited. okay so it's, I'm it'll actually, be my first time it's fun um so i'm teaching at craft fest uh, marketing awesome. the thriller writer so it, that's all that because it's just stuff that i've learned over the years and the key is to like 
you don't have to do all of it um, because you can't. There's so much you can do. And like find, it's kind of like writing. Find what you enjoy mm-hmm. and then and what you're good at and, and stick with that. But there are things that, you know, are pretty important to do. You know, websites and just even some of the basic stuff. Yeah. Um, but it it can be overwhelming. And then the other thing you can do is you can hire help <laughs> because you can get help for really cheap. Um, you can find people around the world who can virtual assistants who can help you uh, yeah. and who have way more skill sets oh. in those particular things. So I do that all the time. And sure, it costs money, but it's not crazy expensive, but it's it's much more effective than me sitting there trying to figure out how to do Instagram stories. That is amazing. I feel like I'm very selfishly just like learning a lot right now from you. <laughs> we'll we'll go care. to my class at Thriller. Yes. I don't know if you're arriving early <laughs> or not. But yeah. So Thriller, have you been to writers' conferences? Now I'm sure you have at this point. Oh, no, no this is I, your first I've one. put out two books in the pan in the pandemic, and so oh, I've both never... came out. Okay. Yes, um, I have. This will be my first, and this Thriller that I have coming out in this August, I think, is the first one that fingers crossed. I, I'm sure saying this is going to make it all fall apart, but fingers crossed, I'll be able to actually like go and do some in person book events. Yeah, well, you probably should be able to. I, I would think so. Which is which is that's so that's so interesting. So your your debut stuff was all pandemic, mm-hmm. so you haven't had that quote unquote normal experience. Which nope. Which is you know those are interesting too, and I think it's kind of existentially changing. Uh, you know because there were so many mm-hmm. obviously by necessity online events during the pandemic, but I think publishers are really starting to see like hey doing a little bit of both is really great because you can broaden your audience. So I just had a launch um, last month and I only did one one in-person event and then I did online events. So yeah. I think that's probably going to be very, very common going forward. The future. Um, yeah, and I, I honestly, um, I like that. Like I'm all about keeping that hybrid model. There were events and people that I've gotten to talk to and like do events with who I never would have had the chance if, um, for sure in person only so for sure and as a debut you know it's kind of like whatever you can do to broaden your uh, uh, scope and yeah. you know another thing we have in common is that you're with um, uh, capability uh, and, yes and I've been with so that's one of the other things that I teach is like you know hold do you hire your own outside PR firm do you not and I I've had eight books out and I from book one I did um, and I've been with K for maybe the last three or four uh, and they're great julia is amazing yes. um, highly recommend so what was what was your I, and i have a couple questions uh, I, i'm curious to know like kind of what what was your thought process for hiring your own um mm-hmm. outside pr but just going back to your debut like what was your process getting an agent getting uh, published rejections yeah i um <laughs> I, I laugh only because um, my debut book, I, I thought of and still still think of as my failure book, um, <laughs> because when I after I convinced myself to just write and I wouldn't show anyone, um, I started writing a contemporary YA fantasy. Like mm-hmm. that's what my brain produced, and I, I spent well, a that's, year writing. That's a popular <laughs> type a very of book. popular genre. Yeah, I was. I think I was just like writing what I was reading at the time. Um, and so I wrote this YA fantasy. I was really proud of it. So by the time like I uh, a year had passed and I finished it, I thought, you know what? Screw not showing anyone. We're gonna go like try to get an agent and get right, this published. Right, right. What is my goal here? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you have to really be self-reflective and be like, am I just going to have manuscripts in my desk for you know, until I'm ninety, and then somebody will unearth them and be like, oh, great grandma used to do this. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I guess you know the world will never see. I think. Like if I, if I really am being honest, you know, a large chunk of why I write is because I am so afraid to like die a a person who hasn't produced anything or like, Mm -hmm. um, I think I, in my head, I call it like, you know, a small person who fades away um, without any sort of legacy. And I know that's probably even problematic way to think of it, but um, because that's all of our fates. But for some, you know, like writing feels like life or death to me mm-hmm. um, now because it's like how I imagine I will live beyond um, my mortal years. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right. But uh, I think just you're naturally, I think, at your essence, and you probably have been since you were 
nine years old going to the library, you're a storyteller. And that has to, that will, that will bubble to the surface one way or another, you know, <laughs> unimpeded by your intentions to do otherwise throughout your life. And clearly it manifested with you saying, I, not only do I want to write this, now I want to start showing it around. I want to see yeah. it published. And, and that's kind of like the, the evolution for, for this, this first book I wrote. And so I Googled how to query. I, um, exactly right. <laughs> yep. I, I figured I was like, you know, I was that person once again, being like, how do you get a book published? <laughs> um, and you know, all the ads for like, pay us $7,000 to publish your book, right. blah, blah, blah. Um, luckily I navigated past those and I started querying and just got slammed with rejection. So back to my old friend, my old familiar territory, um, hundreds of rejections on this YA fantasy. I was at the point where I had re revised it so many times myself. I had paid a little bit of money for like agents to look at it, mm -hmm. you know, um, a few times and give me some feedback. And I was at a point where I just could not figure out what was wrong with this book. Like I was too close to it. I could not see it. Right. Um, and that was about the time I stumbled onto book Twitter um, mm. and miraculously found Pitch Wars, mm. just like stumbled into, which now is gone. That doesn't exist as of like this year. Um, it, it kind of closed closed its doors, but it's it was this mentoring program that paired agented writers with unagented writers um, and mm. helped them revise their manuscript based on the the agented writer's feedback and then at the end there was this agent showcase sorry if i'm explaining something you already know no i'm not actually anyone. familiar with this so okay. that sounds, and so and this was a a paid service or what no it was it's, just all agented writers were volunteering their volunteer time. yeah it's this it, i think that's it was why it was so popular and and well known um and i think probably of all the pitch contests and mentoring programs out there probably it pitch wars was was the most well known because they had some mentees who went on to do like incredible publish very successful books like um children of blood and bone if i'm remembering the title of that correctly just like new york times yeah. bestseller so it was it was seen as a That's good awesome. pipeline yeah, and I, I ended up getting into that program, um, re revised, gutted, and rewrote my YA fantasy, um, threw it into the agent showcase at the end, which is like um, little, they put little snippets at the end of this program up on the Pitch Wars website. They get hundreds of agents that sign up to look at all these excerpts. And it like flips the power dynamic and the agents are requesting from the writers yeah, to like send them the full cool. manuscript. So it's super cool. Everyone talks about it in the writing community or did as like a golden ticket, a Willy mm. Wonka situation. Yeah. So I thought I got my golden ticket. Like this is going to happen for me. Finally, um, I put my, my shiny excerpt of my newly revised manuscript in the agent showcase and crickets <laughs> like like six requests where what do i have to do oh my god i can't tell you carter how like i think you know i think this was actually the lowest moment of my life because right uh which i know i've lived a charm you had life, done everything that was that you needed everything. to do right i had like dropped my my life put my life on hold to revise this manuscript in two months like from top to bottom i had made friends with all the other mentees mm -hmm. who were getting snapped up getting 52 agent requests oh, getting so hard agent to watch offers. isn't it oh my god comparing yourself to others like, is the worst yes i mean <laughs> this is like it's so nice to talk about this because it's it's like a thing you're not allowed to talk about is your your jealousy right um, you're not allowed you're, to be jealous but you're like i'm jealous all the time <laughs> and i hope people time. are jealous of me <laughs> i know and like i would love to think that you know i aspire to that one day um <laughs> but i i so i had this like moment where i think i'm sure it was like the 35th one of my new friends got signed to an agent and i got you know my 35th agent rejection and i said to myself like okay you're feeling very sorry for yourself so what you're gonna do is you're gonna give yourself a night to just wallow like sink to your lowest depths like just you'll do it so i turned one night i like kicked my husband out because he couldn't witness me like this i like, turned all the the lights off in my house 
um, grabbed a bottle of red wine because that's my like particular poison. And I just laid down on my couch, drank it and thought every horrible thought. Um, mm, you just went yeah. right through it, didn't you? <laughs> I just went right through. I, I thought to myself, like, mm. what if, you know, I did X? What if I did Y? Um, and instead of like actively doing any of those things, of course, I came up with the idea. I was like, what if I, what if there was a woman who would do anything, like would do all these horrible creative things that you're imagining? Um, like, what would a character look like, like that? Hmm. And like that woman, I started to see her so vividly, probably because she was like the ugliness in myself manifest. Um, but I saw this woman looking at herself in the mirror, like pouring over her face for flaws and thinking about how well she's done to mm. get rid of them. Um, and that became the character in my first, my debut. Um, oh. so, so you're, that's why you, I call it my failure book. You're, well, but were it not for that book, <laughs> you wouldn't maybe have made that pivot over to kind of the darker <laughs> genres, which you seem to be <laughs> very, I very adept. Home, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be naturally inclined toward, yes. Right. Uh, so okay. that, so that, so then you went through a similar process with the second book in terms of like going to um, uh, Twitter or you were just doing more queries with that one? So I started writing this new book and about two months into it, I, um, my, the last agent who had my, my YA fantasy asked me to have a call like the last shot that I had, who I figured it's been months, that's a write-off as a no, wanted to sign me. And so I wow. was like, yeah, that was a Hail Mary sort of situation. Um, and within about a week after we like signed, I signed the contract, she sent me her edit letter for that YA fantasy. And it was, you know, a 15 page edit letter or something like that. From I an agent. That, from an agent. <laughs> yeah. I looked at that edit letter I thought about the two months I just spent fast and furious revising this damn book. And I thought I could do this again, or I could write this shiny new thing. Right. And so I wrote the shiny new thing. And on like, the, I kid you not, like the due date where my revisions were due, <laughs> like they emailed my agent, the new manuscript. And I was like, no, oh, here's a new thing you weren't expecting, nor did you ask. So there was no communication on your part that you were doing this. So you just blanket ignored everything that they said. Wow, that's ballsy. <laughs> I mean, I told her I, I wanted to in the future write um, across genres and like dab dabble in different things. She said she repped all the genres I was interested in. So she's open to it. But yeah, I, uh, I definitely kind of pulled a fast one on her. Um, but she's not mad. Thank God. Like yeah. she rolled with it. She read the new book in two days, gave me like three things to fix and said she wanted to go on sub. So it's a wildly different experience. Wow. Wow. Um, That's awesome. Like, okay. This is what it can be like sometimes. And then she sold it to Sourcebooks. Yep, sold it to Sourcebooks. And Sourcebooks is great, aren't they great? I mean, I know I you don't have so a lot of a lot of different publishers obsessed. to compare them to, but I do. Yes, no, I I'm obsessed, and right now I'm uh, working with on my thrillers with Sourcebooks and my romances with Harper Collins. So wow. I I'm like with two different publishers. I love Sourcebooks so much. Who's your editor with them? Shana. Oh, you're with Shana. Yeah, I'm with Anna Michaels. Yeah. Oh. So, and I, yeah, I, I think I have four books with them. Four, I forget, but four, I think. Uh, but yeah, they're, and what I've learned from them, you know, and I'm a very, I'm, a, I have a business background. I'm very analytical and they are so into analytics and that's, that's important. I, I, they really look at, you know, titles, covers, you know, you know, depth of market and things like that. Yeah. And, and they can really steer something in, in a direction using those analytics. So I've always appreciated that. Yeah, this is if, if anyone from Sourcebooks is listening earmuffs, but I, I do love that. I think that's great. It's like it, it's so much great information so that you're not just completely flying by the seat of your pants. But at the same time, sometimes I just want to say like, you know, this consumer testing, like, it's great that a lot of people like this sort of thing. But as the like, 
writer and creator of this property. Like, I, I just want to go, like, let me go with this title just because I like it. Um, yeah. Which I know is not like the business decision to do, but I've definitely that. like, it was, it was so interesting to, to view it over the years. Right. Cause I've definitely had titles where everything stayed how I had it. Um, and, and with source books tends to change the title. I think they kept Mr. Tinder's girl. Um, but they'll tell you like, we tested this, we tested this, it tested better. And then I'm kind of like, who am I to, you know, you guys are knowing what you're doing here. I, I have, I'm not part of that world. And this, this is all you do. It's part of what you do. So who am I to say you're, you're wrong, even though, you know, you might have a particular affinity for that title, but I don't feel like I've ever gotten edit notes that were heavily market influenced like you know this isn't thrillery enough or whatever i feel like all their all of their notes are always about making the story better not necessarily oh no maybe that means more marketable i don't think this is ever the primary intention yeah no i totally agree with that um the ed editorial on the on the book is like a whole separate thing this is mostly like covers and titles like the stuff that gets consumer i know it's weird like that email about the title, the title possibilities, or the email or the, the cover art email where you see the attachment and you're like, and you're like trying to open it. You're like, what is it going to be? What is it going to be? Am I going to leave it? Am I going to hit it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's always like, you know, always just like, oh, do I? Is this, you know. So it's, I've, it's I've so learned to let so things go a lot, but I always like what they said. But you do have to kind of. You are much chiller than I am. I, if I could choose a client between us, I would definitely choose you because I'm like, <laughs> I understand it's 100% of people like this better, but me, I right. like this other right. thing and I count for as 101 people. Yeah, they'll beat it out of you after time. So after <laughs> four or five books, it's like, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Hold on to this fight now because it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm excited for all the success you've had during the pandemic and then with your book coming out in uh, August, right? Yeah, August. That's awesome. So are you doing at Thriller Fest, are you, um, are you doing like a debut? Are you part of the debut author breakfast and stuff like that? Yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, I, I snuck in there and there are a few other 2021 debuts in this breakfast. Um, Oh, I don't I'm know sure. who yeah. was supposed to be because there's a lot of 2022 debuts as well. And I'm like, were we supposed to be part of this? But yeah, I will be part of that. That's um, awesome. I'm excited. That's, a, that's always a fun time. Um, so you're, you're going to work out some of your introvert uh, <laughs> tendencies at the conference and speaking at the breakfast and stuff like that. So that'll oh, be no, good. I'm just going to suffer. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, we're going to do a quick storytelling and then wrap up. Okay, I've chosen good. three books off of my bookshelf, very, very much at random. And I'm going to have you pick a book and uh, pick a page and pick a sentence. And I'm going to read that sentence. And then um, either I can go first or you can go first, but you give me a couple sentences that follow wherever we want to take this just for a couple minutes. Um, okay. So the three random books are John Maxim's The Bannerman Solution. I have no mm. recollection of this book whatsoever. Okay. Um, <laughs> Dean Kuntz, uh, Odd Thomas. I think okay. I enjoyed that. Um, and Eric Rickstad's Lie and Wait, which, Ooh. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I don't actually know if I read this one or not. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't read any of those, but we'll pick let's, one. Go, let's go with the last one. Okay. Lie and, and Wait. Pick a, a page between 1 and 450. 235. And then pick a sentence between um, 1 and 5. 5. Okay, this is pretty basic, and you can go however you want with this, or if you want me to go first, just tell me that too. Okay. Victor stood abruptly, knocking over his coffee mug and spilling coffee on the counter. Okay. Um, the sight out of the window was the exact vision he'd been dreading. He knew the car all too well as it pulled up into his driveway. The 87 Camry with at least 250,000 miles on it. The first thing he saw of his ex-wife was her foot touching the pavement. Ugh boots. Then came the rest of her. Ugh, Victor said to himself. She got more beautiful with every passing year. That's what made the knife twist even deeper. It had been three years since the last time he saw her. Um, and every day, regret filled him uh, a little bit deeper, sank him a little bit deeper, 
we'll stop there. For a second, he fell in love all over again. And what a crazy feeling that was to have 20 years of emotions come back in a fraction of a moment, only to leave the instant he saw the gun in her hand. He knew he deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> he knew he deserved it. What he'd done was one of those unforgivable sins if you were a woman like her. Strong, unflinching, a hero, she would have been called if she was a man. And so he brushed off his slacks, walked to the door, swung it open, and met his fate. It takes a particular type of man to stand there and accept what was going to happen. But Victor was not that man. Victor was a fiendish coward. And as he sat, as he stood there, watched her approach, he glanced to the right, to the corner by the door where he kept his hockey stick. <laughs> we can call it there. Okay. <laughs> we don't have to go into extreme domestic violence. No, I, I, had, I had the line where my, I actually like for once thought oh, one line ahead. <laughs> oh, was well, like, okay, what was your line going is, to be? Oh, just that she says like, relax. It's not what you think. Yeah. <laughs> just like takes him on some adventure. Oh, um, I like the, I like the idea that she just put a couple slugs in his chest, <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that's just me. Yeah, that no, was fun. That is, that is super fun. And yeah. now I feel like I want to like try to do that, to kind of jumpstart my own creativity. It is hard to, that is hard. It You're is because what I always say, it's improv, right? So you, you have to accept each other's premises. You can't, yep. you have to do it the whole yes. And that's what the yeah. basis of improv is. You can't reject my premise and I can't reject yours. I have to continue it. Um, and it's interesting to do with like different authors and do you get into a mind meld? I mean, I've done it with nonfiction authors. I've done it with poets, journalists. Uh, and it's just always interesting to see you know, who is visual and who is just straight to the action and, you know, or I whatever. I was going to say, it, it takes a very particular kind of brain that I don't think I have, you know, I like to, I'm a visual person, got to see the words on the page. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I've actually had, um, it was interesting, Maureen Johnson, who's New York Times bestselling YA author, uh, she couldn't do it. She's like, I have to physically see my hands and the words on the screen in order to almost have you know, <laughs> complete thoughts. thoughts in terms of, you know, writing Same. fiction. So that was, it was, so we just, we just sat back and we just talked about what could the story be about rather than like, give me specific oh, lines. That's cool. Um, but yeah, that's really so everyone's cool. different. Really well, what a pleasure to, to, to talk to you, Ashley. And yeah. I'm so excited for you and, and all the success you're having and I'm sure future success and you're with Sourcebooks, which is fantastic. And you're going to go to Thriller Festival. Good to see you there. Very fun. Yeah. Can't wait to meet you in person. I'm so honored uh, to get to talk to you. Thank you so oh. much, Bert. It's such a blast. Uh, I had a really good time. Well, enjoy your weekend, and uh, I'll see you uh, in New York. Sounds great. See you in Take New care. York. Take care. Bye. Bye. So that was my conversation with Ashley Winstead. I told you you would like it. It was good, right? I really enjoyed it. She's uh, she's wonderful and she's very engaging um, and just kind of a fun person to talk to. So I'm glad we got a chance to uh, sit down and get to know each other a little bit. If you want to find out more about Ashley, you can certainly hop on over to her website, which is chock full of good things. And that's just at ashleywinstead.com. Or if you want to find out more about me, look at any kind of tour or appearance dates and certainly sign up for my uh, engaging newsletter just go to carterwilson.com that's it for now more episodes of making it up out soon in the meantime thank you for watching and or listening take care